I'm going to share with you a phrase, and I want you to tell me who said it. Now, these aren't all that difficult, okay? So just shout it out. Won't you be my neighbor? Yes, yes. Let's see some of those uh, people who, who watched Mr. Rogers. rest of you missed out in your life, you know. For 33 years, Mr. Rogers invited children into his television neighborhood. His passion was to affirm kids and let them know they were special. Okay, here's the second one. Help control the pet population. Have your pets spayed or neutered. Bob Barker. That's right. And uh, he was the game show host, uh, retired after 37 years, I think, 36 years as host of The Price is Right. Obviously, he was passionate about animal rights because he ended every episode with those words. Here's another one. A little more tricky. And the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist, that's right. He was sent as a forerunner to prepare the Jewish people for the coming of the Messiah. His message was clear. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus once said, you can tell a lot about the condition of a person's heart by where they spend their money. You can also hear the priorities of a person's heart by what they talk most about. It was obvious by what he said and what he did that Mr. Rogers' priorities were kids. It was obvious by what he said and what he did that Bob Barker's priorities were animals. It was obvious by what he said and what he did that John the Baptist's priority was preparing the way for the Lord. And as we've been reading through the Gospels in the last few weeks, one theme that seems to be dominant over and over again that Jesus spoke about wherever he went, it wasn't it wasn't the theme of marriage, it wasn't baptism, it wasn't even about money, although Jesus talked a lot about finances. The one message that Jesus focused on was the kingdom. Matthew says, Jesus traveled through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news about the kingdom. That was the focus of his message. And we see it mentioned frequently. And wherever Jesus went, he healed people of every sort of disease and illness. Jesus came to earth with a message about the kingdom of God and to show people a ministry that showed them how kingdom living worked. In other words, everything Jesus did supported everything Jesus said. Now friends, if Jesus focused and preached about the kingdom of God wherever he went, then it was obvious the kingdom of God was not just one aspect of the Christian faith. The kingdom of God is the most important aspect of our faith. It's the foundation of our faith. And since some version of either the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, or, or the kingdom, just the kingdom, since that appears over a hundred times in the New Testament, it's obvious that, that we need to have an understanding of what the Bible means, what Jesus meant when he said the kingdom of God. So Luke 17 um, you know, take some time to read uh, the rest of the chapter here. We're just going to focus this morning on verses 20 and 21. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Now, if you take out your bullet or your outlines on the inside of your bulletins, let's first of all define the kingdom. The fact of the matter is, every kingdom, wherever it's located, however big or small it might be, every kingdom has four common characteristics. First of all, it has a king. Since the word of denotes possession, the kingdom of God belongs to God. He is its king. He is its ruler. He is the monarch. He is sovereign over his kingdom. He admits whom he wants to admit into his kingdom. He omits whom he wants to omit from his kingdom. The psalmist writes, God is the great king over all the earth. God reigns above the nations sitting on his holy throne. And in our text, the Pharisees ask Jesus, when the kingdom of God is going to come. Now, I'm not a Greek expert, 
But as I've kind of tried to compare what various people have said here, I think the New Living Translation gets this one right when it says in verse 21, the kingdom of God is already among you. Jesus was sent by God to reestablish God's kingdom here on earth. When Pilate specifically asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus responded by saying, you say that I am a king and you are right. I was born for that purpose. But I am not an earthly king. If I were, my followers would have fought for me when I was arrested. My kingdom is not of this world. And that's why Jesus could accurately say, the kingdom of God is among you. You are standing in his presence. But the Pharisees were blinded to the truth because of their own previous misconceptions. Jesus was not the military general that they were looking for. So every kingdom has a king. Every kingdom also has a territory. I don't know if you remember in Daniel chapter 2 in the Old Testament when the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had this dream. He asked people to tell him what the dream was and then to interpret the dream for him. Only Daniel was able to do it. Daniel came to him and said, here's what your dream is, and then he interpreted it for the king. He said, your majesty, here is your dream. In your vision... You saw in front of you a huge and powerful statue of a man shining brilliantly, frightening, and awesome. And here is its interpretation. You are the head of a great kingdom. After you there will be other kingdoms, each stronger than the previous one, but the God of heaven is going to eventually set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, Daniel said. No one will ever conquer that kingdom it will shatter all other kingdoms into nothingness, and that kingdom will stand forever. Well, the kingdom that Daniel was referring to in that dream King Nebuchadnezzar had was the same kingdom that Isaiah referred to. When Isaiah foretold the coming Messiah, and he said, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government or the kingdom will rest on his shoulders, his royal titles, will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His ever-expanding kingdom will never end, and He will forever rule over His kingdom with fairness and with justice. That kingdom, foretold by the prophets, was the kingdom that Jesus established when He came to earth. So every kingdom has a king, every kingdom has a territory, every kingdom has subjects. Who are the subjects of, of God's kingdom? Well, the Apostle John says, all who believe in Jesus and, and accept him or receive him become children of God. Paul says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Peter writes, you are a chosen people. You are a kingdom of priests. You are God's holy nation. You are God's very own possession. The citizens of God's kingdom live in various parts of the world. They have different colors of skin. They speak different languages. They even worship in different kinds of churches. But they all have one thing in common. They all worship the Lord Jesus Christ as king. So the kingdom of God, or every kingdom I should say, first of all has a king, has territory, has subjects, and then has a law. It's true in the kingdom of God as well. The rich young ruler approached Jesus with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him by saying, you can receive eternal life if, if you keep the commandments. Rich young ruler wanted to know which ones. Now Jesus didn't say it in, in, in these words, but basically what he was telling the rich young ruler was, you need to keep them all. In a monarchy, one person decides what the law is for that particular kingdom. And consequently, the law for God's kingdom comes from God. And God's law is a lamp unto the feet and a light to the path of those who follow it. God's law is not intended to ruin our lives. God's law is not intended to, to take away our fun. God's law is given to us to show us how we can get the most out of life. And when people don't follow God's law, they don't realize, they don't discover what life is all about. So that's kind of a quick definition, if you will, of the kingdom. The second thing we see here is the kingdom of God has come. 
In Genesis 1 and 2, we see a picture of God's kingdom. The Garden of Eden was the way God intended humans to enjoy life on earth. There was beauty. There was order. There was peace. God's kingdom here on earth mirrored life in heaven. But when Satan successfully convinced Adam and Eve to sin, from that moment he set up a counterfeit kingdom here on earth. One that was totally opposite of God's kingdom. And Satan became the ruler of this world. And you know as well as I do that sin and death are part of Satan's rule on earth. From Genesis 3 until today, the human race has been plagued by deceit and anger and hate and murder and death and divorce, and the list just goes on and on and on. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that sometimes God abandons us to our shameful desires and, and God allows us to do things that should never be done. This is not the world that God created for human beings. We have all been born and we have all been raised in a world system that, mark my words, is in complete rebellion against God. And Satan wants to destroy each and every one of us Incest, immorality, abuse, addictions, depression, disease, fear, all of that. That isn't a part of God's plan for us. That is a part of the devil's destructive work. That is who he is. The moment Satan successfully seduced Adam and Eve to sin, God allowed Satan to rule this world. But, God told him at that time, the woman will have a child and he will crush your head. And at that very moment in Genesis 3 and verse 15, Satan was served notice that his rule here on earth would be short-lived. And so as we come to the New Testament, John the Baptist was sent for the specific purpose of preparing the way for Jesus Christ, tilling the soil of people's hearts and, and of their minds so that when Jesus came along and he sowed the seeds of truth, those seeds would take root in the hearts and in the minds of people. John's message was very clear. You need to turn from your sins and you need to turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is near. John was saying at that time, the first century, that which our people have been looking forward to for centuries, that which we have anticipated for a long, long time, is very near, get ready. And a little bit later, after John baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit escorted Jesus out into the wilderness. His 40 days of fasting signaled Satan that Satan's days were numbered. The battle was on. God was about to restore and reinstitute His kingdom here to earth. And so in the Gospels, when demons declared that Jesus was the Holy One of God, they were spot on with their testimony. When the demons asked Jesus, have you come to destroy us? They knew the answer to their question before Jesus ever spoke a word. And 1 John 3 verse 8 tells us Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. When Jesus cast demons out of people and freed them from their torment, when Jesus gave sight to the blind and hope to the hopeless, when Jesus delivered dignity to the despised and the downtrodden, when Jesus healed the lame and cleansed the lepers, when Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of, of those who pretended to be religious, He served notice that He was here to take back that which really belonged to Him. Gordon Fee says, and I quote, In Christ, God has planted His flag on planet earth and declared for all the universe to hear, this earth is mine. And so the Bible tells us, one day, Jesus called His twelve together. And He gave them a power and He gave them authority to cast out demons and to heal all diseases. 
Then he sent them out to, to tell everyone about the coming kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Later on, Jesus gathered 72 others, and he sent them out with the same instructions. As you heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of God is near. Jesus wanted these individuals to get hands-on experience sharing both the message of his kingdom and the ministry of kingdom living before he had to leave them. And now, that's where we're at today. God calls you and I out of the moral darkness and the moral filth that Satan has temporarily forced us to live in, and God calls us into the light of truth that sets us free. Why? Why does God do this? Why is God so good to us? The Bible says it's so that we will declare the praises of Him who brought us out of darkness and into His light. God redeems us so that we can show others the goodness of God. God calls us to be His ambassadors with the same kingdom message, the same kingdom ministry embodied by our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. I love what Paul said to the Ephesian elders for when, when he was meeting with them for what he thought was the last time. What Paul had to share with, him, with them are words that really ought to be the, the mission statement for each of us. Paul said, my life is worth nothing. Nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. And what is that work? The work of telling others the good news about God's wonderful kindness, and love. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. Let me say plainly that I have been faithful. No one's damnation can be blamed on me, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants for you to hear. Can we say, honestly say, that we talk as much about the kingdom that we talk as much about Jesus as we do the weather, as we do football, as we do politics. Here's the kingdom message. When we belong to Jesus Christ, we've punched our ticket to heaven. Paul writes in Philippians 3, verse 20, we are citizens of heaven. That's present tense. We are citizens of heaven. We're the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. And he, he writes in Colossians 1, For God has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear Son. God has purchased our freedom with Christ's blood and God has forgiven us of all our sins. <laughs> it's good news, right? But Paul kind of tempers our enthusiasm just a little bit with these words. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These perishable bodies of ours are not able to live forever in their present state. In other words, listen, if we can poke ourselves and draw blood, we haven't yet fully realized the completeness of the kingdom because there is both a present reality to God's kingdom and there is a future reality to the kingdom as well. Let's look at verse, or the, the third point here. The kingdom of God is yet to come. Today, Jesus Christ has established his kingdom in the hearts of those who have willingly yielded their lives to Him. The Holy Spirit's work in us is evidence of God's work on us. The change in our character, the change in our priorities, that which separates us and makes us different from the rest of the world demonstrate we, we belong to the kingdom. Now to be sure, our numbers are few. Compared to the rest of the world, we are in the minority. Jesus said, the highway to hell is wide. And the overwhelming majority in our world choose to travel that road which leads to death and is ruled by the devil. 
On the other hand, Jesus said, the road that leads to eternal life is narrow, and only a few find it. So Jesus came to this earth the first time as a suffering servant. But know this, when Jesus Christ returns the second time, He will come as a king, He will come as a judge, and He's going to remove evil from this planet for all time. And even though Satan thought he had won a victory, when he saw Jesus there upon a cross, that was on Friday. You know what happened on Sunday, don't you? Jesus rose from the dead. There's no denying that Satan is still influencing in our world today. He's still destroying people's lives today. I understand that. He's still causing hurt. He's still causing harm all over the world. But the kingdom of God landed when Jesus came to this earth and the kingdom of God is growing. And in the time clock of eternity, it's Friday and Sunday's coming. Do you understand that? It's Friday. Sunday's coming. So in our text, the Pharisees asked, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus told them, the kingdom of God has come. If you'd open your eyes and if you'd open your ears, and if you'd open your heart, you'd see I'm here. I'm standing right in front of you. So the kingdom of God is here. It's, it's present. It's near to those who, who have the Holy Spirit, who represent Jesus here on earth. And as a result, you better believe it matters how we live while we're here. It's not just, hey, I'm biding my time until I can go to be with the Lord. It matters because either we as as God's people, those who belong to His kingdom, either we are conforming to the evil pattern of this world, adopting the customs and the habits and the sins of those around us, and in doing so, if that's the way we live, we testify to the rest of the world that this kingdom thing isn't all that important. Or, and hear me now, church, or we are imitating the life of Jesus Christ, we are sharing the kingdom message with other people, we are living the kingdom ministry of Jesus amongst those around us, and as we do that, we testify to the rest of the world that kingdom living is the only living that works. See, it's that simple. But, having said that, the completeness of that kingdom living, the, the utter fulfillment of it is still a future reality. It will not be fully restored here on earth until Jesus Christ returns and cleans up the mess that Satan made. And so, and again, we don't have time to look at it, but if you want to later read verses 22 through 20, 33, Jesus later, after he talked with these Pharisees, took his disciples aside and he shared with them in verses 22 through 33 when he would return when He would forever restore this planet to the way that God intended it and created it to exist. When the combined Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy during World War II on D-Day, they broke the back of the Nazi forces. They ensured their future total victory. Now, there was a major loss of human life on both sides on June 6th of 1944. But the momentum of World War II radically changed with that victory. There were more skirmishes, there were more battles, there was still a lot of life that was lost. The Allies went on to reclaim that territory, which had belonged to free people before Hitler and his evil allies moved in. And for all practical purposes, the Nazis were defeated on D-Day, even though there were those future battles. Many more lives were lost until V-Day, Victory Day, when the peace treaty was signed on May 7th of 1945. Jesus' death on the cross was our spiritual D-Day. You and I will never fully appreciate or understand what Jesus endured to change the momentum of this spiritual battle. But in the first century, all those centuries of Satan's rule had made it very bad. 
And even though Satan still has his temporary victories, and even though I know as we look around us, we see that he's still, he's still in control here, his days are numbered. That's what the truth of Scripture is. The king is coming. Our V-Day is approaching. And you better believe that when Jesus returns, every eye will see him. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what our message is. And until that day, you and I need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Many years ago, a sociology class from Johns Hopkins University did a study of children in, in some rundown neighborhoods of Baltimore projects. And this class, this sociology class, identified 200 children whom they believed, because of the circumstances and the conditions they were living in, this class identified 200 children they believed were destined for prison. 25 years later, a follow-up study was done. And all of those 200 kids were interviewed. Do you know that only two only two out of the 200 were eventually arrested and placed in prison. Only two. And as these adults, these 200 adults were interviewed, the name of, of a teacher kept coming up over and over and over again. These 200 kids would have all ended up in this satanic evil cycle that goes on. except for the divine intervention of a Christian teacher they called Aunt Hannah. You can Google her name in Baltimore and see the testimonies. One person became a doctor. One became a prominent businessman in Baltimore. And the list goes on and on. Aunt Hannah belonged to the kingdom of God. She had a kingdom ministry and a kingdom message. And it wasn't just those 200 kids she impacted. It was their kids and their spouses and their grandkids and generations of people that she'll never know until she gets to heaven. So when you and I pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You realize we are asking God to help us be the fulfillment of that prayer. It's not popular to follow Jesus Christ in our culture. As a matter of fact, the more I read, the more I understand that we're becoming the target. The more I read, the more I'm seeing that we're the blame for what's happening in our society today. The Lord wants to know today this. Are you for me? Or are you against me? There is no middle ground. It's one or the other. Are you prepared to fight this battle, whatever the cost might be? Are we committed to living the kingdom of heaven here on earth? Because believe me, there are a lot of people around us who need what only Jesus Christ can give.